here we have three important chemical elements. The first one, hydrogen, is from the first row of the periodic table. Fluorine is from the second row of the periodic table. And chlorine, on the right, is from the third row of the periodic table. Recall that for hydrogen, it wants to satisfy the duet rule. It wants to have two electrons. And we represented that in the card by showing this one region up here, shaded gray, that has two holes in it. The reason why hydrogen wants two and only two electrons is that being in the first row, its valence shell is a 1s orbital. There is one 1s orbital and it can hold up to two electrons. Therefore, that's where we get the two from in the duet rule. Fluorine, on the other hand, is on the second row. So quantum number n equals two. We have both 2s and 2p orbitals available. There is a single 2s orbital and three different 2p orbitals. Since each of those one plus three equals four total orbitals can each hold two electrons, fluorine in its outermost valence shell can hold up to eight electrons. And we represented that by four of these gray shaded boxes, each with two holes in it. Now, once we get to the n equals three and further levels, we have the availability of not only the three s orbitals and three three p's, but we also have five of the three d orbitals. Each of those orbitals can hold two electrons. So conceivably, elements in the n equals three and below levels can hold up to 18 electrons. Now, we can divide those electrons into two classes. One is the required electrons, and that is the four shaded boxes. That will fill up the 3s and 3p orbitals. And those are the orbitals that are most likely to be filled with electrons. Now, there's the option, the possibility, of putting further electrons around the nucleus. And we've denoted those particular optional electron positions by the white boxes. So when we're trying to make a Lewis dot structure for such elements, we're reminded when, as soon as we look at the card that we want to satisfy the octet rule with the gray shaded areas, but we have the option to add additional electrons in the white positions. Notice that this is simply not possible for the n equals two level. Since there's only 2s and 2p orbitals available, there are no extra holes available around the electron, of the, around the nucleus. And this reminds us that we need to satisfy the octet rule and we cannot go beyond it. Whereas for the n equals three levels, the card reminds us that we are required to satisfy the octet rule, but we can expand the octet. We can actually add additional electrons if necessary around that particular atom. Now, in some chemical compounds, we will satisfy just the octet, and in other compounds, we will satisfy the octet and expand it. We'll have to look at the individual compound to determine whether we expand the octet or not. We have already uh, developed a Lewis dot structure for difluorine, F2. Chlorine is the next element in the same column of the periodic table. Column seven, which we call the halogens, and halogen comes from the Greek words for salt former. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all in the same family and they have many of the same chemical properties. Within the Lewis Langmuir theory, they all contribute seven valence electrons to any chemical compound to which they belong. Now, one big difference between chlorine and fluorine is that since chlorine as an element is in the third row of the periodic table, we can conceivably expand the octet for chlorine. 
That is why the cards for chlorine look different than the cards for fluorine. Chlorine as an element exists as a diatomic gas, Cl2. Each chlorine contributes seven valence electrons. So in this entire Cl2 molecule, we have 14 valence electrons. So we need to allocate our 14 valence electrons so as to satisfy the octet rule for each of the chlorine atoms. And we see that we can do that, we can satisfy the octet using up all the electrons, and we don't need at any point to put any extra electrons in these optional positions. So in a certain sense, the Lewis structure for chlorine is exactly the same as the Lewis structure for fluorine if we're drawing it with pen and paper or ink and paper. When chlorine gas is exposed to visible light, the visible light has enough energy to actually break the chlorine-chlorine bond. And it tends to do this homolytically, which means that the bond breaks so that one electron goes to one chlorine and the other electron goes to the other chlorine. And we're left with two seven electron species. Whenever we have an odd number of electrons, we have a free radical. So here we see an example of an atom of chlorine existing as a free radical. Since we've already seen that free radicals are particularly reactive, we might imagine that individual chlorine atoms are going to be very reactive. So they are, and they tend to react with organic molecules by a free radical mechanism. That is almost invariably how chlorine is going to react uh, if we start with Cl2. The next element in the series of the halogens is bromine. Bromine exists as a diatomic liquid. It is one of the very few elements that exists as a liquid at room temperature. Again, since each bromine contributes seven valence electrons, Br2 is a 14 electron system. And again, we can satisfy the octet rule for each of the atoms by uh, having a single bond between the two bromine atoms, and then we can allocate the electrons at all the required positions, and we do not need to expand the octet for this particular compound. When bromine reacts, it reacts somewhat differently than chlorine does. We had seen that chlorine tends to break the chlorine-chlorine bond homolytically, thereby forming two free radicals. Bromine, on the other hand, tends to cleave the bond heterolytically, so that one of the bromines gets both of the electrons, and the other one gets neither of them. As a result, the species on the left-hand side is a bromide ion, as Br minus one, and on the right-hand side, we have a bromonium ion, Br plus. In organic synthesis, the relevant reactive species is generally the bromine, the bromonium ion, the Br plus, which tends to attack uh, double bonds, for example. So this is an important reactive difference as we go from fluorine to chlorine down to bromine, that we have a change in the mechanism that's involved of the reactivity of the halogen, particularly with organic compounds. At room temperature, elemental iodine exists as I2 as a purple solid. Again, following a similar pattern with the other halogens, each iodine atom contributes seven valence electrons giving us 14 electrons to allocate over the entire system. And we can satisfy the octet rule for both atoms so long as we share two of the electrons in a single bond between the two iodine atoms. Now it turns out that iodine is a useful chemical reagent, but it does not dissolve well in water because it's not, it's covalent. So it's a nonpolar material. To make it dissolve better, the trick that we use in the laboratory is we add an extra amount of potassium iodide 
the iodide ion will react with the I2 to form I3 minus 1, the so-called triiodide ion. To form the valid Lewis dot structure for the triiodide ion, we note that each iodine atom will contribute seven valence electrons. There are three such atoms in the ion, which gives us 21 electrons. And we note that it has a minus one charge. For the minus one charge, we add another electron. So that gives us a total of 22 electrons to allocate over the system. So first we note that if we fill up uh, all the gray areas, the required areas, so that we have an octet for each of the iodine atoms, and then we connect the iodide atoms with a minimum of a single bond, in the process, we allocate 20 of the 22 electrons. So in this case, we have two extra electrons that we have to put someplace, and we, but we've already filled up all the gray areas. So what we do is we see, oh, since we're past the second row, the third row or beyond, we can expand the octet. So here's the first example that we've shown where we are required to expand the octet. And we put our two X electrons in this white box here, showing that it's optional. Uh, it's not required to satisfy the octet, but it's permitted. And since we have to, we can't throw away the electrons. We can neither decreate nor destroy electrons because the fermions, we have to put them somewhere on the molecule. So we can put them on. Now, typically, if we have extra electrons and we're expanding our tet, we will put them on the central atom. It's either the biggest atom, the most electropositive atom, the least electronegative atom, the central atom. So that these are the general rules of where we will put extra electrons when we expand the octet within a molecule where we are required to expand the octet. So for triiodide, you will learn later on in the VSEPR theory that this molecule actually is perfectly linear. The three iodine atoms will be in a row. And to get the correct structure, we have to allocate the two extra electrons on the central iodine atom, thereby expanding the octet. One great advantage of the lewis langmuir theory is that it makes extensive use of the periodic relationships that we find in the periodic table. Earlier in this episode, we look at that in the case of the halogens. Each of the halogens contributes seven valence electrons so that the structures of F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2 are essentially identical. We have two atoms and we allocate the electrons in a analogous way for all four of the compounds. We can take that idea and extend it even further. For example, in the sixth column of the periodic table, we have the elements of oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. We have already looked at the Lewis dot structure for the ubiquitous compound water, H2O. So building on that concept, how about if we replace the oxygen with the other members of the same family to see which particular compounds we get when we do that and how we would build the Lewis structures. So the next analogous compound in our series will be hydrogen sulfide, H2S. H2S is a noxious, poisonous, foul-smelling gas, whereas water is a colorless, odorless liquid. But the Lewis structure is constructed in a, the same way as for water. Each hydrogen atom will contribute one valence electron. The sulfur atom, just like oxygen, will contribute six valence electrons. So H2S just like H2O, will be an eight electron system. Remember that we have to satisfy the duet rule for each of the hydrogens. So we're able to do that with four of the electrons. And then by allocating the four remaining electrons in the required regions, the gray shaded areas of the sulfur atom, we're able to satisfy the octet for sulfur as well. So we see that except for these white flanges on the card, the Lewis structure of H2O and the structure of H2S 
are identical. We notice in this particular case that even though sulfur being on the third row of the periodic table is allowed to expand in its octet, for this particular compound, there is no need for it to do so. In general, if you can construct a valid structure where you do not expand the octet, you should try that one first and leave the expanding the octet to those circumstances where merely satisfying the duet and octet rule does not work. Hydrogen selenide, H2SE, is, just like hydrogen sulfide, a foul-smelling gas. Since selenium is in the sixth column of the periodic table, it contributes six valence electrons. Overall, this molecule is going to have eight valence electrons. So we see that substituting selenium for sulfur in the center of the compound will change the chemical properties somewhat, but will not change the Lewis structure at all. So we'll notice that making use of these periodic relationships, once you know how to construct one member of a family of compounds, you can almost immediately write down valid structures for the other members of the family. Selenium is an interesting element in that it can replace sulfur in the amino acid cysteine. So whereas normally in textbooks they say that there are 20 uh, amino acids, in reality there's actually 21, and the 21st is the selenium analog of cysteine. So selenium is required for human life in very small amounts, but in high levels, it is poisonous. Hydrogen telluride, H2TE, is, as you might predict, a foul-smelling poisonous gas. To make a structure, we need to allocate eight valence electrons, and we allocate them in exactly the same way as we did for hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen selenide.